first we'll start with Wayne Madison, a biologist at UBC, and he will be telling us about his discovery of the music of evolution. All right, thank you. So, uh, I so I hope you can be quiet enough and I'll try to shout. So I've never given a talk in this style before and perhaps I never will again. Uh, um, I have given a top, talk on this topic before and it's usually a 50 minute talk to biologists and now I'm going to try to do it in about seven or eight minutes to a general audience which means it's going to be compacted enough that it may become uninterpretable and my hope is is that if nothing else you feel like you're on a drug trip and, and I hope it's a good trip, okay? <laughs> okay, okay, now I gotta start over here, okay? Once upon a time, life originated. It started off pretty simple. It reproduced, uh, changed, evolved. There were genomes evolving, there were cells, metabolism and so forth, and it wasn't just a single cell, of course, it was replicating. It was replicating into more and more different sorts, each lineage of cells following its own fate. And so the evolutionary tree of life started. I'm not going to spend a lot of time in these early years, I'm just going to fast forward two billion years or so until we get to a special point where the cell became more complex. And the cool thing about that moment was that not only did the cell become more complex, but sex evolved. And sex is really cool, not just for the reasons that you and I think it's cool, but because it involves the interchange of genes. And once genes became interchanged among organisms, it allowed mixing and matching, it allowed remixing, it allowed mashups, so that a mutation that happened in one organism on one part of the genome could be combined with a mutation that happened in another organism on another part of the genome to make the best of both, and that new combination was better than either, and so evolution could start at a better pace. It could happen more quickly. Once that happened, something else came about, which is genetic communities, because those in organisms exchanging genes, that's like a language of genetic innovations. By exchanging this information, they became knit together into these communities of a genetic sort. We call them species. And so now, we've got our little species coming along here, our species lineage, exchanging genes, a genetic community, but sadly it doesn't stay together all the time. Something might happen. Some of them might have get blown off to some other island or something. And so we suddenly have this genetic community split in two. This keeps happening. This genetic community splits in two. This one splits in two. This again is part of the evolutionary tree of life, but now the lineages are species. They're genetic communities. This keeps happening, and the cool thing is, at every point, I could, in my story, tell you about one of the branches, or the other. I'm going to follow a particular branch, but just realize I might have followed the other and told you the story of it. Um, so this evolutionary tree of life is like a grand choose-your-adventure book, okay? But, here we go, choosing our adventure, different lineages, I'm following one particular one at every point, and now I'm going to jump forward to about a billion years ago, after, Nerves have evolved, muscles have evolved, multicellularity has evolved, a head has evolved, and we've now reached a point where we have a little worm-like creature, and I want you to remember this point, okay? And I'm gonna make, let you remember it by throwing this down. So this is the point where we have a little worm-like creature, and there's a fork in the road at this point, because at this point, one of those sunderings of genetic community that get, leads up to a fork in the road going two different ways is, is an important one to me, and we'll get back to it, okay? But I'm just going to follow this one branch, and it's going to keep going. Sooner or later, one of the branches of it evolves fins, skeleton, uh, the jaws, the fins turn into legs, then fur, then milk, and then eventually we have humans. Let's give a cheer for the home team. Okay? We got that. Okay. Now we're going to come back to this fork in the road. Okay, remember this was a little worm-like cre- oh my god. Oh, there we go. <laughs> so, extinction happens sometimes, what can you say? Okay, so now, what happened to the other fork? The other fork went on its merry way, evolving all sorts of things. It, remember, it's a multicellular animal at this point. It evolved legs, not just four of them, more than that. Uh, things kept changing, and sooner or later we had a spider. And in fact, it's a particular spider that I'm going to show you. So now, you can say goodbye to the evolutionary tree of life for a moment, because 
Here is the spider. This spider was a jumping spider that looked up at me when I was 13 years old. I was fascinated with it. I looked down at it. I, I, I used, kept it as a pet. But I also wanted to know what other sorts of jumping spiders there were. And so over the next several decades, I started studying the diversity of jumping spiders. And what amazed me was how huge the diversity was. And you look at all of these different forms of jumping spiders. This is just one family, different shapes, sizes, different ecologies, and so forth. And you might get the impression that it's nothing but ubiquitous uniqueness. Everything is different. There's no pattern there. Everything is unique. And in fact, this notion that evolution produces all of these simply unique endpoints is possibly reinforced by going back to our worm. Okay? So now, if you think about this little worm at that branch in the road, those two forks, if you looked only 100,000 years after those genetic communities were separated, you'd have two worms that were no different than a coyote and a wolf, for instance. And yet one of them led to humans and lots of other things. The other led to spiders and lots of other things. That's completely ridiculous. That these two things, starting off from almost the exact same point, ended up in such different points at the end. And you know very well that if a third chance had happened, it would have ended up somewhere else. So you get the sense that evolution is incredibly unpredictable. And we have all of these unique endpoints. So you might think, there it is. But it's not quite that simple. When you look at the evolutionary tree of jumping spiders, and that's what this is here, you might ask, well, is it the same there? At every branch, everything's completely unpredictable. There is no pattern. Is this a diversification without pattern? And the answer is no. So it turns out that there are some jumping spiders that look like ants. These are all jumping spiders. They even behave like ants. Uh, and when we look at this, we combine this with the evolutionary tree of jumping spiders, we see that this type of body, an ant-like body, has evolved at least 10 times in jumping spiders. So there's repetition here. It's not patternless. We can then zoom into a particular part of the evolutionary tree of jumping spiders that I happen to love, which is a group called Habernatus. And I love them because the males of these guys, they're not peacock spiders, but they're related. Uh, the males of these guys are incredibly beautiful with colors and plumes, just like any bird of paradise. But they also do dances. So these are different males doing their courtship dances to the females. They can be incredibly complex. I have to decide how long to let this run. I hadn't really planned on letting it run very long, but these guys do crazy things. I'll let it run just long enough for the guy in the lower left to shake his knees out there a couple times. Okay? So they, these jumping spiders, Habernatus, have incredibly fancy males. Cool thing. But they've also got something else cool, which is that males have Y chromosomes in some species. And you may say, well, duh. Why wouldn't males have Y chromosomes? We have Y chromosomes, human males, but most spider males don't. Most spider males have two Xs, females have four, whereas some Habernatus have a Y. And that's a weird thing in spiders. And when we look at the evolutionary tree of this one group, Habernatus, we see that the Y chromosome has evolved many times. We're starting to see repetition here again, about 10 times. Turns out that it's correlated with something else going on. It evolves more or less together with a change in chromosome behavior. And I don't have time to get into the details of this, but we suspect that it may be related to, may be provoked by, this very thing that I talked about before, the fancy courtship. It's a sort of a bizarre story, but the fancy courtship may lead to these changes in chromosomes. And so what it seems like the story is here is that fancy courtship leads to shifts in chromosome behavior and Y chromosomes. And it's repeated. So we've got sequence. Basically that one thing provokes another. We've got a sort of harmony that different things are correlated. They go together consistently. And they seem to fit together. We've also got repetition. So when you look at an evolutionary tree like that of jumping spiders, you see sequence, harmony, repetition, and surprise. And over the last several decades, I've been looking at the evolutionary tree of jumping spiders. I've got to know, I've probably seen a thousand species alive of jumping spiders. And 
It's really difficult to explain what that feels like to be able to put into your mind's eye a thousand species of jumping spiders. Now, that may scare you, but to me, I see this beauty. And I see also this tree. And so it's not just static beauty, it's dynamic. I picture in my mind's eye, along the branches of this evolutionary tree, the diversification of this group and all of their beauty and the dynamics of that through time. It's sort of a stunning thing. And I really wish I could somehow express that to you. What it feels like to me is music. And I think you sort of get the sense of it because it is dynamic. It is changed through time. And so I can't really get it into your head without you going through the experience that I did. But I realized I'm a computer programmer. I do computer programs that have to do with evolutionary trees. Maybe I can make this happen somehow, OK? OK, so I have no idea if this is going to work, OK? So this is the evolutionary tree of Habernatus as we've reconstructed it with our interpretation of the evolution of this chromosome behavior. And I'm going to play just this music, OK? And so what's going to happen is, is that it's going to go from left to right, from the ancestors to the descendants, and it's going to be playing the notes of the, the chromosome behavior as it goes. Could we get those guys across the street to quiet down? Oh, good. There we go. <laughs> OK. I can do it again. It's not coming. Oh, you know what? Oh, it's because it's HDMI. OK. <laughs> the, HDMI, the HDMI is stealing the sound. OK, you're going to hear it without the graphics, OK? <laughs> OK. Now at this point, I'm still hopeful. OK. So now you're sort of thinking, well, that didn't sound very transcendent, but let's, let's try the next. So then I'm going to show you the evolution of the Y chromosome. So here's the evolution of the Y chromosome. What, is this just the males clapping now? What is this? <laughs> OK. There you go. OK. So it takes a while for another change to happen here. Those are the two directions of changes, the high note and the low note. OK, now we're going to put them together. This is supposedly the symphonic thing, right? The whole phylogeny with all the changes on it. So I got to say, I was disappointed. <laughs> and, and you know, I could have put a lot more work into this, but what I realized, what I realized at that point was that I hadn't differentiated the different lineages. They're all using the same notes. And what I should have done was that at the base of the tree, have it diverge into the woodwinds, and the, and the stringed instruments. And then on the stringed instrument side, it diverged into the violin and then the more bass instruments and then the violin and the viola, et cetera, right? So that we could have differentiated the different voices and the different lines of descent in each of their own melodies, right? Maybe, right? So I sort of feel like it, it was sort of a good idea, but this transcendent thing is still in my head and I don't think it's in yours. So the best thing I can say to you is go out and look at lots of jumping spiders. Thanks. <laughs> So, actually, I'll, I'll answer questions if, if the timers let me. Okay. Two questions. Two questions, by the way. Yeah. Um, did the dancing make the spiders kind of gay? Is that, what is this? Why? What is this? 
I don't, I'm not getting your question. The dancing led to some kind of gender, sexual variance? No, 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 no. See, most, in most animals, it's the males that put all the makeup on and do the dances. It's just the way it is, because they've got to impress the females. That's just the way it is. It's the females, in most animals, it's absolutely, completely the females that decide, period. Okay, last question. Um, at the worm moment, when yeah. you, uh, were there only two variations or did they split, 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 split so, more Yeah, so we don't really know because that was a long time ago, but probably it split just into two at that moment, but it might not have been very long after that that those two split into many more. So if you think about who the descendants are on both sides, on the one side, the side that led to us, it also led to somewhere around probably 70 or 80,000 species that are alive today. On the other side, it led to somewhere around 10 or 20 or 30 million species that are alive today. 